who don't know me, um, well done. Um, and uh, I'm not sure Steve's Milo's back in the room, but I'm Doug Moore. I was one of the co-founders of the Instant Software, and uh, back in 2010, probably lit the blue touch paper that may have created some of the storm that you guys are experiencing today. Um, because of that, I'd like to extend in advance my apologies. Um, if you're going to throw anything at me, could you please wrap them in hundred dollar bills? Um, the uh, the other thing I am is one of the founding members of the VRM Consultants, which I'm really quite excited about. It's just a group of us. I try and do as little work as possible. Uh, work for me is actually a four-letter word. Um, so uh, uh, I try to do very little, but I love coming to these things. Like it's important to support the industry that helped me get to where I am. So um, I feel it's imperative that we, as a, as, as a group of people who have an, an amount of knowledge, share it in the most applicable and, and, and generous way, and that's what I try to do. So, um, and the other thing is, <clears throat> I don't think Steve Myler's in the room, but let me just say, I have never been happier that he was never one of my clients. <laughs> um, because, you know, I've had a lot of people who are unhappy with me, but man, that's pretty, well, okay. It, it pains me also because he's really unhappy about something that used to be mine. And, uh, and, that, and that's a bit difficult, certainly part of it at least. So let's kick off. So I'd like just a quick show of hands. I know many of you, but I, I've been away under a rock for quite a while. So I'm not necessarily up on what technology you guys are actually using at the moment. So if I could just have a quick show of hands. How many of you in the room are using a home away software product that's currently available? It's APO P12, okay. Um, how many of you are using what I'll call the instant software retiring product? Are there anybody still in the room running first resort, perhaps? No, no, okay, good, good, that's good. Anybody here that's uh, not using a homeware product, but their product that they do use is web-based? Yep, and is there anybody still using something that's in their offices, like the Linos AS400 or something, where you can actually go and physically touch your servers? Are you still running those? No? Yep. Okay, cool. And then last, is there anybody running what I call a hotel resort system? Springer Miller and IQware, those sort of things that aren't what typically running the traditional PMS. Okay, so great. So now I know where we're at. So, Amy asked me to do this thing that says, getting the most out of your property management software and new technology. So that's the title. So what's the reality? Well. The reality is that first, there's a series of steps that you need to do in order to get there. So step one, you may sound like this is really, really important, hire a consultant. Okay, there you go. All right, the end, version one. <laughs> Done, see you in the bar. Nope, oh, okay. So here's how it works. How many of you are familiar way, way back in the day when IBM mainframes became prevalent and everybody thought, man, this is great. Did anybody use those sort of old, really old steam-driven computers, those things? Okay, so there's a thing about version numbers. This is the old trick. Always, always, always run an even-numbered version. You may think that sounds funny. Software companies, and I'll get thrown out of the Software Developers Club a couple of times during this presentation. Um, software companies release odd numbered versions. <sighs> version one. Anybody ever run version one of Property Plus? Yeah, thank you. Hey, I, I wrote in it was bad enough. So <laughs> here's how it works. It's always even number, version two. Version two, or the even numbered version is the one where you fix all of the stuff you broke or got wrong in the odd numbered version. So this is version one of the end. Guess what? I hope when we get to the end, version two is a little bit better. So let's go. So I'd, I'd like to start by people say, what is the PMS? Well, let's talk about it. Back in 1996, when I started, I only had to do four things. Somebody said, hey, you should write something for this industry. Oh yeah, what's this industry? Oh, it's four things. It's a little bit of a housekeeping, a little bit of accounting, reservations, and some work orders. I thought, man, that's really easy. 
Yeah, right. Okay. Until I realized that it was 50 different countries with 100 different versions per country, and nobody does it the same way ever. So, that was what it was in 1996. Do you know what else was there in 1996? Do you know what the Google Analytics dashboard looked like in 1996? Like that. Because Google weren't even formed until 1996. That was when they registered the company in 95, and um, they registered the domain in 1996. So just in, what, 21 years? Look what you do. Every day you get up, and some element of your business is dependent upon Google. You know what an online reservation looked like in uh, 1996? There's a call holding online one. Okay? So again, what is it now? Well, 10 years later, look what happens. These are the core product things that we had to develop within the 10 years. We had the advantage. We had 10 years to do it. So the, the part of all of these things that have come online now, online distribution, your image management, online bookings, lead management, lead management, for goodness sake. Who thought you'd be dealing with stuff like that? 2005 was when HomeAway, or what they were used to be called, they became HomeAway in 2005. So all of the things that you rely on today, or 10 years ago, and still today, we have the luxury of taking 10 years to develop them for you. Pace of technology is changing ridiculously. So where are we today? <coughs> Excuse me. A PMS, or a property management system, this is me, this is my opinion, but it's fact, is no longer a single product, it's an ecosystem. It's an ecosystem of products that have to work together in order for you to do what you need to do. So no longer is it simply the core. You have to talk to home automation, distribution, CRM, websites, all of those things, and they have to be interdependent on each other. So how do you get the best out of what is your property management system? It's no longer a system, it's your property management systems. So one core PMS, isn't sufficient for you to be able to leverage any effect on the production of features because no one system can do it. So here's a question, and you know, we all talk about APIs and XYZs and ABCs and all of the other things. Uh, how many, and please, nobody's going to judge, but how many of you actually really know what an API is? Because it sounds really clever, doesn't it? It's like, oh man, it's an API. Right? And then people start saying, what's well, an API? It's an open API. So here's the thing. All it is, is one computer talking to another computer, and then another computer, and you don't have to do anything in order to make that happen. So you put something in here, and if you have a connection between this system and that system via an application programming interface, that's what it stands for, that's how you move data from one side to the other. So what does that mean? Well. It reduces the amount of work you guys have to do. You back, remember, you may used to have a BRBO. Everybody's been on BRBO for a long, long time and around here. The original property managers who were progressive was like, yeah, we're going to put all our stuff on BRBO. Well, that's great. Take a reservation in first resort. What do you have to do? You go up from one computer, go over to another computer, you log into BRBO, and you change their calendar on BRBO because now, guess what? It's no longer in date. In those days, you were the application programming interface, right? That was what you were. All it needed was two computers or two screens. So now it does it for you. What does that do? Makes your life easier, right? Really? Does it? Okay. So it may make the job of moving data from one part of your systems to another part of your systems seamless. But does it always put it in the right place? Does it always wait? Does it always transfer at the right time? Well, I heard some things this morning that made me cringe. The re-harvest. Steve spoke about that this morning. In 1999, when we first started moving data from Probably Plus to ISL, to the original ISI link, the process was called a harvest it would appear it's still happening. Certain things last longer than you think, right? Um, so what is an API 
And what's the difference between a closed API and an open API? Typically, and this is really, really layman's terms, typically a closed API, most of what I developed and you're using today, are, developed, uh, are running through closed APIs. That means that the software company that offers the interface controls access to the interface, in essence. An open API pretty much means, here's how you interact with us, and we absolutely don't mind who you are. Just go ahead and do it. Salesforce, for example, has a phenomenal open API. If you want to write programs of your own that connect and utilize the Salesforce data, you can do it, right? It's fantastic. How many of you, you okay, now, so let's go back. Who uses V12 still? You know? Okay, so I don't think the interface has changed terribly. On the right-hand side of the screen is one box. On the left-hand side of the screen is another box. And underneath the middle of the login screen, there's a little box that sometimes you might see and sometimes you might not. That little box is connected to the Salesforce system that I, we used to use. And if I wanted to write you a message, I just used to put one single piece of information in that field. And every time you opened up V12, it would go and pull that piece of data and, and display it for you, which is great if you want your bill paid. Because what happens if you put in a little screen that says your account is overdue and this system will quit cease working in five minutes, when every one of your reservationists sees that, guess what? Open systems are the way of the future. Um, that's what's going to happen. An open API, meaning that in order to sustain all of this mass of technology, the software provider, the core PMS provider, is going to have to, this is again, I believe, going to have to open up their system to some degree or another, and somehow, okay, to enable you to interact with your data in ways that they either don't have the resources to do or they don't want to do. So open APIs are where the future is. Does anybody know Vanessa de Souza no. She uh, She's the CMO of uh, uh, one of the distribution companies called Rentals United. She's also founded an organization called VR Tech, which is basically a group of people who get together and discuss how tech goes to the future. She made an interesting, you can go ahead and read it, I won't read it to you, but what it in essence says is don't subscribe to any system that doesn't have an open API strategy. Okay? Doesn't mean they have to have one now, but they don't have the strategy. And the reason is, as she said, where all make promises, you all fall into the trap of I've got one system that's going to do absolutely everything and it never does. So what you need is for people to be able to build systems that can talk to each other and you don't need to have one person control how that works. So based on all of that, do you need a new system? No. You don't. And the reason you don't is because not one system is ever from this point forward from about five years back, isn't going to be capable of doing everything technologically that you guys need going forward. We physically do not have the resources to do it. You can't develop it at the speed that you would wish, and nobody has either desire or the expertise in the individual segments to be able to do it for you. Now, if you have five units, and you want to go and install a system that does the majority of these things adequately for you, yes, you will be able to do that. But as you grow and you get bigger and bigger and your demands get greater, there is not one system out there that will be able to do everything for you in a best of breed or best of class way because they physically do not have the resources or the experience to do it. So what does that mean? Ah, well, okay, unless. So you don't need a new system unless. Unless your existing system can't do the job, right? That seems reasonable. It can't handle your growth. And there's a serious deficit in existing features that are required for you to do the job. You know, if it can't produce own statements, you need to look for a new system. Um, an abundance of new features out there are compelling enough, and that's an important part, compelling enough to make a change. Or the change would provide you with new revenue streams, perhaps, where you might be able to get to distribution you can't currently get to. Or in certain times of hardship and in a situation where you can actually achieve significant cost savings without lack of functionality. And that last bit's important because you don't want to give away stuff just for the sake of uh, saving money. Or 
if your existing system is being retired in 2019? Well, you guys don't have that problem. If there's no connectivity with the technology providers that you want to use and no desire to do it, or the last one's really interesting, if you just like root canals without anesthetic, knock yourself out, because there is nothing more disturbing than changing property management software. And if you really do want to go do it, then I, uh, my partner Tom Kazmarek and I wrote an article in the inaugural VRM Intel magazine that walks you through the process of how to do it in the best possible way. Or you could hire a consultant. Right? Um, so now we're here. How do we get the best from what you've got? Okay, so the first thing you've got to do is figure out what you must have and what you want. And there is a difference. And remember, this is an interesting one. Technology without a benefit is just a complete waste of time. If it doesn't save you something, generate something, or minimize an amount of effort, why do it, right? Just don't. So before you start, you've got to figure out your business. How do you do it? The first part that I always tell people to do is walk around your departments and do a needs analysis. What do you need? What is it that your department really critically needs in, a, in your existing technology? Look for something that involves an excessive manual process or a duplication of data and effort. Even though back to the old VRVO days, you'll find there are systems that you have to go and duplicate data and duplicate effort into. So try and look at those. Find them. They may not be as evident to you from a management level as the person who's it's their job to do that. Well, you think, well, why? Why are you spending this amount of time duplicating effort when you don't need to? If you have stuff that has a high staff requirement of labor or time, you have costly subcontractors that you use in order to achieve something. And if there is a shortage of vendors to do a specific task, because there are out there are uh, systems out there that will actually help you go and get vendors to um, bid and all the other systems that are out there now that will actually help you source uh, vendors and contractors to do work. And then you're going to have a list, and you say a list, and everybody has a list, and it's like, if only we could do dot, 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 whatever that is. And then the other list, which is just as important, which is if only we didn't have to do dot, dot, dot. So now you've done this analysis of what you're doing and how you're using your systems. But before you do it, you figure out what your business is doing. So then you have a list, hopefully. You have a list. It's a list of things. That's what I like, don't like, would like, need, must. Now you've got a list. So contact your vendor and determine the features that they have that you're not using or that they might be developing. When I used to lose clients for, and, and you, we try and always do like an exit interview, which is what happened, did accounting piss you off, you know, did we piss you off, did the support people not get back to you on time, is there something that it did that you didn't like, or is there something we didn't do? When they used to say, oh, we left because they didn't do this, or, yeah, the way it did, that was really bad. So we, we, it was awful, and, and you know, that was why it was. And you look, and as, as somebody who spent all my life developing software, and you go, hey, you idiot. Oh. So contact your vendor and find out what they have done that you're not using. Get a current demo. Bear in mind, unless you like root canal without anesthetic, right, there is no point in not experiencing your system you use today as if you were about to buy it. Because what happens is that you get used to it. It's like an old pair of shoes. You get it in the morning, you put it on, it's the most comfortable thing, and you just keep walking around in these shoes. But you don't look to see whether or not there's something that you might be able to take advantage of if you made a very, very small process change to your business, or you went and looked at a way of looking at having to do things differently. One of the people who are doing that for you at the moment, actually, is Homeway. And again, not necessarily the software part of the business, but the listing side of the business is forcing you, no, they're not, that's, a, that's harsh. They're seriously encouraging you. Um, 
to modify the way in which you do pricing to fit into the tech into their technology because it's easier to do that than it is to modify their technology to fit into the way you do business Expedia have been singularly incapable of doing that since 2001 and, and, and because that and same with booking.com because they're hotel based systems and you guys you have to make yourselves look like a hotel in order to rent on those on that technology and your story so what they want is they want lodging rates they want and, and they're telling you that will help your rankings and all of the other things. No, it won't necessarily. It might, but it doesn't need to. What it'll do is it'll help you get your stuff into the technology. Um, but now you've got your list, give it to the current vendor. Say, here's the things that we want that are important to us. Can you actually do them? Ask them. Does, it, does their system have an API and a, or direct connections? Any way of connecting? And if it doesn't, are they building there? Go to their conferences. Talk to other people. Listen to it. That's how you get the best out of any PMS or any product, is to figure out how other people are using it and what they're doing with it. And train your stuff. One of the big issues that most people have is that the only time you are ever trained by the software company is the day that you install the system. So if you installed your system, in 1996, and you haven't been retrained since that time, then what actually is happening is that your new staff are being trained by somebody who got trained by a guy from the last time you changed over, and they got trained by the guy the last. So the, imper the impression of the system that your users have is only the inherited knowledge from the people who trained them, and it typically isn't the people that are selling you the system. So if your vendor offers you training, Take it. Look at it as if there was a review. A lot of people benefit significantly by almost asking, can I start this system as if I was installing it today? And how would I use it today? It goes back to get a, get a demo. So that's how you can invest in your existing technology without having to change it and without an excessive amount of cost. The second part about it is, back to the all the things that surround the core is over the years, we collectively, the technology people, the other side of the room and generally air and rest of the industry have come along and said, we have the best thing since sliced bread. You need to use it. Some of you go, oh man, yeah, great. So it's just another thing to add to the technology stack. So you keep adding new things. Locks, locks, fantastic. Smart homes, they are great. Marketing, external marketing channels, external automation, your website, your distribution systems, all of those things that are out there that are currently either provided by a third party or as a niche within your existing technology, <coughs> review them, look at them, and apply the same principles as you would to everything that you were looking at to go forward, which is, are they working? And are they deriving benefit? Because remember, technology without benefit is just a pain in the butt, right? It's not helping you. Is it helping your guest experience, your owner experience, or is it just something that you may need to look at again and say, is there something better out there that does the same job that delivers me more benefit? And if you think, well, what's available? In Amy, in the August issue last year of, uh, of VRM Intel, put this like three, I think it was three pages wide in terms of this graphic, and it won't fit here so that you can read it, of the tech stack that's available by sector within the industry. So if you think there's nothing new that's out there that you haven't looked at, I bet you there is. So have a look at what's out there, right? But what's out there that might help you? And again, it's health, not humans. So, there's some dynamic pricing, revenue management, right? CRM, fantastic. The comparative analytics, I think that's essential. <coughs> Electronic locks, it's all about improving the guest experience without necessarily increasing cost. Smart homes. And I think smart homes are the way of the future. I have a serious concern about smart homes. 
Um, and I'll come back to it in a moment because I've got a quote up there from, um, from Steve. But automated communications, the guest and owner relationship, it makes these days the systems are so good that they make it look like they're not automated anymore. You can actually define the different points of contact, the way, and it really doesn't look like just we sent you a stock email. It really is very clever. Automated payments these days, guest portals, the ability to recharge, and all of the things that come out of that. Greater distribution integration. Maybe that's what you need. Maybe that's not what you don't need, right? Um, call center integration. This new unit asset management, breezeways types of products, those things where you're actually turning your unit into an asset, monitoring it, and seeing, making sure that there's value in the process, those things. You've got the, the housekeeping and maintenance supply systems properly. I don't know if anybody knows that. It's phenomenal. How, I need a housekeeper. Next half, now that may not work in your business, but the ability to get supply of additional um, resources on a non contract basis is what has made Airbnb as successful as it has. Those sort of things. The infrastructure and ecosystem that's grown up around Airbnb is astonishing. The owner and vendor and guest portals. Now you've had owner portals for years. Do they work? Do they work today? Will they work tomorrow? What's going to happen? Where does that technology go? Uh, the new guest housekeeping and maintenance mobile systems. Apps, be they apps, be they mobile. The, the extension of the glad to have you type products. Those things, they're great. Will they help you? Look at them, try them, test them, see if they're for you. And the new ones that are coming along, as Peter was saying earlier on, he had bought a company that can control the guest experience, could provide an in-unit like guest book app, or it's actually a website type product. There are also products out there that will track the, uh, the access to the Wi-Fi and basically, you've got to collect all the email addresses in order to sign on to the Wi-Fi. That's phenomenal because the, the OTAs are going to take that away from you if you get the opportunity in a unit to be able to control that experience. That's again. So now you know everybody who's in there. And there's an extension to those which, which could be unbelievable, which is think of a scenario where Every device that's in the unit is connected to the unit. There's a router in there that's monitoring that. And on the checkout day, you realize that the number of connections went from 50 to 1. And the 1 is the DVD player because it's hooked up to the internet, right? Do you think they might have left? So not even. How many of them call you if you don't see them? and say, yeah, we're off, or did, how many of them use the feature on the lock that they type the special code that says I've gone? Well, those sort of things are great. Now, it's a bit awkward if you find they only went down the road for breakfast, and now everybody came back an hour later, and the housekeeper's in there clearing their stuff out of the drawers, but at least you know. Then look at your existing systems. What happens with those? So this is addressed to a number of, we talked about a bit of it. This, this goes back to functionality that Steve uses in his system, and most of you have it that are using the V12 product and, uh, and most of the other products these days, which is the ability to redefine your rules per channel. So, for example, and that's not just price, that's cancellation, that's all of the other things, which add-ons get used, do you bundle, do you not, um, all of those things that are available to you, because if you're going to leverage not just the tech side of the business, but the OTA and the, the distribution side of the business, then those are the things that you're going to want. You're going to want to be able to control only certain units are available here. Only certain units with these characteristics can be booked this way. All these units can be booked that way, because that's the only way you can keep control of the things that the OTAs, bless them, are trying to grapple away from. Changing your pricing rules, going to the, are you going to go to the lodging rates? Are you going to go to the lodging rates for them and not for everybody else? Because if your system gives you the capacity to do that, then add at it and mark them up 20% while you're at it. Why not if they don't require rate parity? And then the last part about it is market maker. It has other names. I won't use them because I'm being taped. Um, <laughs> well, I'm probably being taped. Everybody's got a cell phone, right? Uh, I didn't christen this name, but somebody told me it's not market maker, it's widow maker. Um, the, um, 
the truth of the product is it's similar to Airbnb's pricing suggestion tool. I was talking to somebody the other day and they said, I've got a pricing suggestion from Airbnb. It said to me, if I reduce the nightly rate by $620, I would get a booking for Labor Day weekend. <laughs> and I think it sent it to him June 3rd, something like that. Uh, it said, if I don't reduce the rate by $620 per night, I'm going to get a booking for Labor Day weekend, right? But these automated suggestion tools are only as smart as the people who program them. Bear that in mind. Um, so those are the products that they're only based now. The OTA landscape is changing. We all know it, Steve. Let us all know that this morning. My thought is it's becoming, it's moved from a relationship business, which this business is a relationship business. It doesn't matter if it's a relationship with the owner, the guest, the vendor, or as a technologist with the client, this whole industry is built on relationships. HomeAway used to be built on relationships. They're now becoming transactional. So the problem with that is that when they're becoming transactional, they don't care. They want the money from the transaction today, and they want to move on to get the next transaction. Airbnb is no different. They want you to consummate as a get, as a as a renter. They want that booking, so they don't care what they have to do in order to get that booking, and they want that booking on their channel so they get their travel ticket. So what does that mean? What market maker and the suggestion tools are doing? They're not helping you. They're helping them. So if you're looking at these things, bear that in mind, right? Now, it may ultimately, in certain instances, benefit you, but that isn't the intent, right? If you pick a dozen things to do, my advice is don't do them all at the same time. You're going to fail. One of the reasons that changing your property management system is so awkward is because you have to keep so many different plates in the air at the same time because you're in essence changing everything rather than just focusing on one individual thing. So pick them, implement them one at a time. That doesn't mean that you have to wait a long time before doing them, but please don't try and do them all at the same time. Replace, if you're replacing things, replace the ones that cost you a lot first. This one's interesting. Make sure the integration's a good one. And the reason I say that is that a lot of systems, the situation goes where, do you talk to HomeAway? Yes. Do you have an integration at HomeAway? Yes, you do. Absolutely great. Right, okay. So you're moving from one system to the next. Do you have an integration with HomeAway? Yes, absolutely we do. It's fantastic. Okay, great. So when you're in the middle of that integration, you find that, eh, maybe it's not quite as good as it could be. The stuff didn't quite go in the right place. Oh, now you have to redo some stuff because it doesn't work the same way. So now, but just having an integration isn't necessarily the case. I'll give you a prime example. A dear friend of mine in Orlando who was customer number five switched systems out from Property Plus a few years ago and they had an integration to a smart lock company. And the vendor, uh, the software vendor, had an integration to the smart lock company. So he thought it was fine. Well, many of you may not know, but there were a lot of reservations, especially to those people who speak like I do, right, to the Brits, they come for two weeks, they don't come for one. So that's because we get much, much more holiday over there. Um, so this integration, fantastic. What they realized on the first weekend after they installed the system, and we're up and running with it, was that when the system went out and got the lock codes, it only got them for a week. So if you're here for two weeks, guess what? Your lock code runs out after the first seven days. Well, they're in Orlando. So where do you think everybody is on a Saturday? They're at the theme parks. So they all leave, they are out you go. They come back from the theme parks at 11.30 at night after the fireworks and everything's fantastic. And they, get and they can't get into their unit because the lock code's no good anymore. So having an integration isn't necessarily enough. Make sure it's a good one. Make sure it works, test it. And as I said, don't try and do everything at once or you're going to fail. Um, so what's next? This is Steve's quote. 
we're going to see significant changes in home automation systems in the way they interact with locks, HVAC, pool, cleaners, service personnel, and everything. I actually agree with you. I do. I think it, that and his voice concept is, is going to be an astonishing next generation of technology in our industry. I have one concern. The concern is most people, if you walk into a unit with a smart, lock, uh, with a smart home and everything else, where's the router? Where's the brains, the little box? Right. So when the 12-year-old wants to recharge his iPad, and he pulls out the thing, and plugs in his iPad charger and walks away, and then nothing in the house works, right? You have to be careful. So my, my concern is these things are all great, but make sure you put them in a cabinet that they can't get it. Um, so, so we looked at what it was in 1996. And we looked at what PMS is today and in 10 years. What's it going to be like in 2028? What do you think? What's your crystal ball? Right? What do you think it's going to be? Here's mine. I actually think that the center of our universe or your universe is going to shift. Currently, the center of your universe is the system that controls the money. Right? Every single one of you is running a system where the, it, the the money comes into the core system, and that is the core. And it owns everything else. It's the silo, some you can get at, some you can't get at. I think, and I have no dog in this hunt, I am not under any circumstances developing any of this, but I think that the central hub of the technology in 10 years' time will revolve around a CRM. I think it won't be Salesforce, it might be, but it won't necessarily be. It will be a relationship management product, and there may be more than one of them, and their core is going to be maintaining the things that are most important to you. And your accounting will tell you it's the money. It is. It's the relationship. Because if you don't have the relationship, the money's not coming anywhere. So that, in my terms, is where the future is going to be. There will be best of breed marketing systems, there will be home management systems, and the home management will be cleaning it, fixing it, making sure the stuff's still there, all those things. And that, in my opinion, is what 10 years from now, when we look back on this landscape, it will look like. So the end, version two. Hopefully, version two is better than version one, right? And now, if it's open, I'll see you in the bar later. But, so, does anybody have any questions? Wonderful. I finished early then. <laughs> well, thank you very much indeed. You've been wonderful. I hope it's of value, and I look forward to seeing you at the next one. Thank you very much.